we need resources to the field because, as you will soon hear, preemption is a critical yet thorny issue that comes up all the time when advocates are pursuing new public health-related policies. We can engage the Public Health Law Center to prepare and give this presentation because Doug and Julie are top-notch attorneys who have a wealth of experience grappling with preemption, both as government lawyers and as public health advocates. So I'm going to turn it over now to Doug and Julie. And well, and thank you for giving us some of your valuable time and probably some of your attention as well today. From the registration information, that preemption is an unfamiliar topic for most of the folks on the call today, or one that is at best only vaguely familiar. And we know from experience that that means that it's probably something that sounds to you uh, as though it's quite dry and technical and legalistic. Over an hour or so, we hope to convince you that, in fact, preemption is one of the most important issues in all of public health policy, and that understanding preemption is vitally important to your effectiveness. And we'd like to get you started on that process today. My name is Doug Blanke, and with me on the call is my colleague, Julie Ralston Aoki. We are attorneys at the Public Health Law Center in St. Paul, Minnesota, where we help people like you in developing and defending effective public health policies. It happens that Julie and I also share a common background in that before we were working in public health law, we each served for long periods of time as assistant attorneys general here in the state of Minnesota. And for both of us, preemption has been a recurring theme throughout our careers in different areas of the law. I spent the first several years of my legal career at the Minnesota Attorney General's Office defending state laws against constitutional challenges. And then I directed the State Consumer Protection Division for about a decade before becoming involved in tobacco litigation and ultimately public health and have been for the last nine years here at, um, at what we now call the Public Health Law Center in St. Paul. And through all of those experiences, prison was a recurring theme, whether we were working on issues related to warranty protection on automobiles or the regulation of banks or the provisions of health insurance policies or environmental protection, and certainly it has been a dominant theme in the area of tobacco prevention and control. Hi, this is Julie. And I I want to thank everyone for joining this uh, conference, say good morning, good afternoon, and to some, thank you for inviting us to your lunch break. Um, I'm really glad to be here. As Doug and Sam have alluded to, I uh, spent about 10 years at the Minnesota Attorney General's Office as an Assistant Attorney General in the Antitrust and Consumer Protection Divisions, where I worked on investigations and cases involving a range of industry, but including healthcare companies, uh, looking a lot at deceptive marketing practices and other business regulation issues. There, my job was to enforce state antitrust and consumer protection laws, and of course, preemption was a very common defense raised to enforcement actions. At the Public Health Law Center, I've worked primarily on issues relating to marketing practices, initially on tobacco retail advertising, which, is, as many of you know, until a few weeks ago, was highly preempted uh, by the federal government. And now I spend most of my time working on issues relating to food marketing to kids. Now, based on those experiences, Julie and I know that free can have sort of a Jekyll and Hyde quality. You've never been caught up in a preemption fight. It may sound like the kind of uh, legalism that you're particularly happy to leave to your lawyers. But once you've been drawn into the preemption battles of gun control regulation or alcohol regulation or tobacco prevention and control or other similar areas, then for you, preemption is probably the P word. And evokes more um, emotion and concern than almost anything else in public health. So what is preemption? How do you spot it? How do you decide when it's a potential threat? 
you manage it when you think it might be a threat, that's what this training today is going to be about. Well, we know that preemption is a topic that often makes people's eyes glaze over. It seems very technical, abstract, even academic. It's an issue that only a lawyer could love. And we also expect that some of what we talk about in the next minutes is probably going to feel a little bit like a lesson in civics or theory. That's why we want to emphasize, while everybody's still fresh and, and, and paying attention, that behind all the terminology, something real is at stake. It's political power. Because if preemption's in the air, that means that there's going to end up, there's going, someone's going to end up having the power to do something about an issue, and somebody else is not. They're going to lose that power. Now, in the next 40 minutes, these are the four main topics that we intend to cover today. And keep in mind that this really could be a four-hour training, and I'm sure that you're very glad that it's not, um, and we are too, but that means we only have a little bit of time to cover a complicated area, and so we're going to really just touch on some basics. And we urge that if you're interested in it or want a deeper explanation and further discussion on this on this issue, that you find get the uh, companion paper on preemption that's available on NPLAN's website, and there will also be companion fact sheets uh, canyon to this web, this presentation, and to the paper that will be out in the near future. First, what we will do today is to provide you an overview of what is preemption in a lawmaking context. Then, we plan to delve more into why it matters from the viewpoints of those who are affected by it. Third, we're going to talk a little bit about what the trade-offs are, the potential pros and cons of preemption, again, specifically from a public health perspective. And finally, we're going to hit on some of the key questions that we think uh, one should think about when they're gearing up to support a new public health law proposal to help you better be prepared about um, to make strategic decisions about preemption when it's on the table. So to begin at the beginning, what is preemption? Well, um, in a nutshell, preemption is the invalidation of a law by a high level of government. There's a lot more to it, of course, but that's really the essence of what we're talking about. We don't intend today to try to dig deeply into all of the terminology or all the different forms that preemption can take or how governments go about creating it, and certainly we won't be going into how the courts go about analyzing and interpreting a law to decide whether it's been preempted. For all of that, we refer you to the white paper that's been uh, prepared in conjunction with this presentation. But we do need to ask you to bear with us for about 10 minutes as we introduce several of the core concepts that constitute the basic building blocks of preemption so we can talk about how it's likely to affect you. We need you to go back with us, uh, if, you, if you don't mind, to that ninth grade civics class and the day that they talked about federalism. Maybe you skipped out that day or maybe like me it's too long ago to remember very clearly. But to recap just quickly, federalism is how we describe the way in the United States we divide up power among the different levels of government. We're a federal republic. National government was formed by the free consent of the people acting through the states. And acting through the states, the people gave up some of their inherent powers and hand them over to the creation of the national government, handed only over those specific powers that were spelled out or enumerated in the Constitution. That's why you sometimes hear of the national government as a government of limited powers, even if that's a concept that sounds kind of foreign with all that's going on in Washington today. The important thing to remember is that within its areas of authority, the national government is the final authority. And it has the ability, when it chooses to do so, to trump anyone else. That's preemption. So the to remember out of all this is that, that ordinarily the higher levels of government have the ability to override the lower levels of government if they choose to do so. And this can take a number of forms. Now, when preemption originates from Washington, we refer to it as federal preemption, and although the slide says preemption of states and cities, it should really say states and local governments, whether we're talking about a county or a special unit of government. So preemption can originate from the federal level. 
scope preemption refers to the federal government's ability to deprive lower governments of the power to regulate in a particular area. It comes from the clause in Article VI of the Constitution known as the Supremacy Clause. That's constitutional provision that says, the law of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land, anything in the laws of any state contrary notwithstanding. We usually think of federal preemption as something that is done by Congress through the enactment of a federal law, and that is perhaps the most common form. But federal preemption can also come about from the rules of a federal agency or presidential order or even from a treaty that's ratified by the Senate. What it might come from, federal preemption has the ability to override any state or low law, but not just laws. It can over override also the rules of, of state or local agency, and it can even override a lawsuit. The lawsuit is based on a state statute or a state common law cause of action. It doesn't have to originate from the federal level, though. It can also be state preemption of local laws. Here, very broadly speaking, the rule is similar that, again, broadly speaking, states have the power to override almost anything that their subordinate units of government do. The point for the courts is the general concept that local governments are thought of as the creatures of the states, something that, that owes their that owes very existence to the states, and accordingly the states have the ability to limit what those lesser governments do. That's the general rule, but there's an important uh, limiting consideration in many states, and that's this concept of home rule protections, something that varies quite a lot from state to state that may originate from the state constitution or from pre-existing charters of some local governments. What we will tell you today is that if you're a state that has home rule protections, what that generally means is that for a local home rule government, there may be some areas of concern that are particularly peculiarly, peculiarly local in nature. In those areas, the local government may have some insulation against the ability of the state to preempt what the local governments do. By and large, it works very similarly to federal preemption, and states can override the city and counties. Remember, the federal preemption can also reach down to the local level so that federal law can override something that a city or county might be doing as well. Mike <clears throat> has uh, given us an overview of the basic underpinnings of preemption. So keeping this background in mind, my goal right now is to give you a sense of the range of preemption from the minimal to the maximum. And the main point for purposes of this training is to convey that the consequences of preemption can range from being relatively benign to being actually very harsh, depending on how it's structured. Now, the least intrusive, more benign, some might even say desirable, again, from a public health standpoint, is the type of preemption that's inherent whenever a higher level of government passes a law that sets the minimum standard of protection, or a floor. Now, the floor, the lower level government can do more, but it can't do less. In other words, the lower level government is free to act whenever there's floor preemption. Now, what floor preemption might look like is a statement in a law that says something that, like, uh, local governments may pass laws that are more restrictive than state law. Twenty to thirty years ago, this was actually a more common type of, of quote-unquote, preemption. But now what we see is really more on the other end of the spectrum. We're calling ceiling preemption. And I want to make sure to clarify that when, when people or we talk about preemption and the concerns it raises, what we're really talking about is this kind of preemption, ceiling preemption. This has become much the much more prevalent form during the past 20 years. Now, what ceiling preemption is, is when the high-level government forbids the lower government from doing more than the higher-level law. Now, in the most extreme form of ceiling preemption, it might not only forbid them from doing more, but the high-level government actually prohibit the lower-level government from passing any law on that area even though the higher level government imposes no regulations at all, where there's essentially no floor at all. That creates essentially regulatory vacuum. Now, an example of this in the uh, obesity prevention 
television context happened in Georgia where the state, the legislature passed a law preempting cities and towns from passing menu disclosure requirements, even though there is no state law on the subject. So that's an example of a really um, harsh form of ceiling preemption. Now in between these two ends of the spectrum, there are a variety of, of forms that preemption can take. For example, uh, to have a state law that preempts new local laws on the issue, but grandfathers in existing laws. Um, you could have a state law or a federal law that preempts only lower level laws that are inconsistent with the high level law. Um, another approach, which was actually more common back in the uh, um, 70s and 80s, at federal level was to generally preempt state law, but allow those states who want to impose more regulations or approach a subject a little differently to seek a waiver from the appropriate federal regulatory agency. So just a few examples of some of the in-between forms of preemption. And one thing to keep in mind is that preemption language is like any other language in a statute. And so if it's going to be in a law, then it can and should be the subject of negotiation. And so the important point is to remember that it really does matter how it's phrased and it matters quite a lot. So we talked a little bit about what preemption is. Now, um, as I mentioned before, I'm going to talk about what, how preemption matters. And I mentioned before that preemption matters because it's about political power. Now I'm going to talk more specifically about how it matters from the perspectives of some of the key stakeholders or groups who are affected by preemption. Of course, I don't think it's any surprise that preemption matters a lot to business groups. And it's clear because whenever there's a push for preemption, business interests are usually the ones doing the pushing. Now, why is that? Well, it's not hard to imagine that there are some sound business arguments uh, for preemption. I mean, ceiling preemption particularly results in a lot less regulation in one standard as opposed to a couple or two or three. And of course, it's easy to understand that it's, ch it's cheaper and easier to implement and put in compliance measures if you only have to worry about one standard. But remember that preemption can also be a method for deregulation. When business interests seek uh, preemption, they're usually not seeking floor preemption, they're seeking ceiling preemption. And they're not seeking to establish the ceiling at the strongest or even the second strongest, say, local law um, standard, but they're typically typically proposing a significantly diluted standard to try to set the ceiling as low as possible. So clearly, the, the goal is not just to seek uniformity or achieve uniformity, but also it's to achieve a uniformly weak standard. And of course, some of the ceiling preemption means that there will be no regulation at all. Now, it bears repeating that preemption really does matter to business, because when you think about it, the legal history in this area is kind of surprising. During the past 20 to 30 years, we've seen the regulatory landscape go from favoring floor preemption, which leaves state and local governments free to act, and really is almost a, a more protective approach to a ceiling approach, which either significantly restricts or actually eliminates the ability of state and local governments to act. And we've seen this trend in a wide variety of industries and areas. For example, during the last decade, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has submitted legal briefs urging preemption of state power over areas such as the pharmaceutical industry, medical devices, mortgage lending, pesticide use, whole electric rates, cigarette advertising, telemarketing, cell phones, union organizing, and a host of other issues. Uh, there, in 2006, a Committee on Government Reform at the U.S. House of Representatives issued a report talking about this trend of preempting state authority and described that in just six years, from 2000 to 2006, Twenty-three preemption provisions were passed by the House and Senate, resulting in 39 of which became law. And the most co areas that were commonly identified as being the ones where this happened were areas where local governments historically have exercised a lot of autonomy to protect the public, such as consumer protection, health, safety, and environment, and areas that have relevance to public health. Now, attorney generals are usually on the front lines of defending or enforcing state laws, and they refer to this trend as the ongoing preemption wars. And of course, earlier this year identified preemption of state authority as one of their top priority issues to approach the Obama administration with earlier this year. And this brings me to my next point. 
of preemption matters a great deal to state and city policymakers. Of course, one can understand that because they're losing their power to regulate. But the concern is not just about diminished power. Uh, for the, the state legislators have been so concerned about this trend that they have the National Council Conference of State Legislature has established a division that it calls the Preemption Monitor, which monitors the efforts at the federal level to uh, preempt state and local authority through federal law. Now, as recently as July 2009, NCSL, the National Conference of State Legislators Preemption Monitor, expressed concern about sealing preemption, uh, emphasizing not just that it was losing, that states were losing power to federal authority, but emphasizing that the concerns that, that preemption actually curtails state creativity and imposes a one-size-fits-all standard where such a standard is not needed, and noted that, quote, what works in one state is not necessarily practical or effective in others. So it's not just about losing power, it's also about what that loss means to, or that shift means to our regulatory system. Okay, so that's all well and good, you could say, but what does that mean to me as a public health person? Well, in addition to all the things that Julie's been talking about, which apply almost across the board of public policy, attention is a particular concern to those of us in the field of public health. And this is true because public health is first and foremost a matter of state and local responsibility. It's true first from an historical perspective. Health protection originated at the local level and for the most part it still resides there. We can think about from our public health training, learning about the days in the origins of public health, the days going back to that famed cholera epidemic in West London when Dr. John Snow removed the handle from the Broad Street pump. And I remember that episode, we'll remember that it was the municipal authorities of West London who were dealing with the cholera epidemic. It wasn't the national government of, of Great Britain. Or for those of us who practice in the legal area of public health, think about the most famous legal case in this area, and that's the Jacobson case of 100 years ago in the U.S. Supreme Court, a case about the power of the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts, to require smallpox inoculations. And, and that ground in the local um, community continues to this day, whether we're talking about public health prevention or immunizations or disease surveillance. This is true if we look at public health from a legal perspective. The power of government to act to protect public health is something that arises from what lawyers call the police power. And despite the word police, this isn't something that has to do with police departments or criminal justice. It refers to the inherent legal authority of law and state governments to do whatever is essential to protect the general health, safety, and well-being of the community. This is regarded as part of the intrinsic natural authority of local and state governments. And while it may not um, seem immediately obvious, in our constitutional system, our federal government has no comparable authority. There is no inherent legal authority of the national government to act to protect public health. So whether we're speaking legally or historically or just describing where public health is done, it really is first and foremost a local and state responsibility. Now care is about preemption. We may not um, be relatively obvious either. You might think that the head of the federal government would be almost the last uh, official to be worried about protecting state and local powers. But the end of the last 20 years toward massive preemption of state and local authority has been so strong that it has even drawn the attention of the new administration. And in May of this year, President Obama issued a potential memorandum to the heads of all the federal agencies, instructing them to be more careful in the future not to preempt state and local authority until they had given full consideration to the legitimate prerogatives of the states, acknowledging, as you see here on the slide, that the best protections for the public often originate from the state and local level. With all of those people so concerned about uh, it does it matter to all of us who are public health professionals? 
First, for all the reasons we've already said, it matters to each of us uh, in important ways in our daily lives simply because we are members of society. We heard a number of examples, but to take one uh, enormous example from today's headlines, many officials around the country believe that one of the main reasons that our country is in the current economic crisis is that financial companies were very successful in invoking federal preemption down all of the state regulators who were trying to act aggressively to police subprime lending abuses and, and mortgage lending abuses that were leading our economy over the cliff. If they're right about that view, then every one of us who owns a house or uses a credit card or worries about our retirement ought to be concerned about preemption, and it matters to us. Or specifically to our role as public health people, um, we've already noted that how we answer preemption questions can have a powerful impact on health. And most importantly, from a personal perspective, the answer to those questions will determine what our personal roles and the roles of our agencies will be in shaping public policy. All we have to do is think of just a few examples. Take alcohol regulation or tobacco prevention or gun control. In each of those areas, we have seen fierce battles about preemption and who should be setting public policy, and in fact, preemption has been central to the policy debates in those areas for many years. And in each of those areas, the industry involved has fought hard to prevent local and state control, and advocates have emerged out of those battles highly skeptical of preemption. And those of us who are focused on obesity prevention need to expect similar debates as we move forward with public policy. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, the Institute of Medicine has released a major report calling for adoption of a long series of recommended low policies as primary strategies for obesity prevention. Really, if local officials end up preempted from acting in that area, then their effectiveness will be greatly limited or maybe even eliminated altogether, and the public health will suffer. That's why we think preemption matters. Now let's let's um, turn to fairly confident that we're likely to encounter proposals for preemption as we go forward with health policy making. Let's turn now to thinking about how we should assess those proposals. How should we determine when they might make sense or when they are threatening? What is going to be gained and lost if we consider accepting a preemptive approach? Now, I want to hasten to add that we focus on some of the potential trade-offs and pros and cons for public health. There are many others that would be important to business interests, for example, or to others, and they can go through their own calculations in deciding what their positions should be. But for those of us in public health, what are some of the pros and cons for the health consequences of how we approach preemption or consider whether to shift decision-making Toward a higher level of government. Okay. When preemption, particularly ceiling preemption, we know it essentially restricts or eliminates local control. So when preemption is on the table, that means local control is on the table, or perhaps more apt to say, it's on the chopping block. So if, if local control might be on the chopping block, then we think you should really know what else goes along with it. And as I'm going to talk about four benefits to local control as borne out by experiences of public health advocates in several fields. Now, this slide illustrates the point about innovation. The important benefit of local control is innovation. As many of you probably have firsthand experience with, local policymakers in fields like alcohol, tobacco, obesity prevention, and a variety of public health areas have a history of being innovative and willing to test new policies and try new approaches to improve public health. Now, willingness to be innovative, of course, is especially important where a policy area is unsettled because either the science is evolving or because understanding of what works is evolving. And here, it could be especially dangerous to cut off innovation and experimentation with a pre preemptive law. Like, for example, we are familiar with state laws that prohibit drivers from talking on cell phones while driving. But imagine what if those laws were preemptive and limited to cell phone, and by their language just happened to be limited to cell phone use because nobody was really thinking about the problem of texting while driving. So if laws are preempted, now jurisdictions are trying to, we have science about distracting text texting while driving, and if 
jurisdictions were trying to deal with that, their hands could be tied if those laws had been preempted. What goes along hand in hand with innovation is another benefit of local control progress. Uh, and as many of you know, local policies often serve as a forerunner to and then a driver of policy at other levels of government. And why this? Because local control results in an environment that can foster natural leadership and pioneers and encourage pioneers to act, who then raise the bars for others. A good example of this in the obesity prevention context is New York City, uh, who passed a trans fat, which passed a trans fan, and then went on to pass a menu labeling disclosure, which led to movement uh, at the local level around the country. Another clear benefit of local control is accountability. Now, if you remember how I talked about business interests often push for preemption as a way to lower regulatory stand standards, this strategy is an acknowledgement of the fact that local policymakers are more easily held accountable to their constituencies. And of course, again, that makes a lot of sense. At, lo at the local level, there's more opportunity for face-to-face -face interactions. People live in the communities that they're passing legislation for. Thus, local policymakers tend to be more responsive to public sentiment, and as a result, it's easier to get local laws passed or changed or to strengthen or repeal them. What is needed is justified by the evidence or experience uh, at the time. Now, the higher up you go in government, that changes because experience has shown that it gets much more difficult to revisit an issue or get a law amended or, or repealed at higher levels of government. In public health fields like gun control, tobacco control, and alcohol policy, industry groups seek to use preemption to push decision making to higher levels of government where their, their political influence is greater. There is less accountability to to grassroots and, and local advocates. There's no more hometown advantage, there are fewer policymakers to try to influence, and industry, industry interests tend to have stronger lobbying influence. influence. One more well-known examples, and you may be familiar with this, comes um, from Victor Crawford, who is a former tobacco industry lobbyist who essentially underwent a deathbed transformation while dying of a tobacco-related cancer. He explained that the tobacco industry quote, unquote, first priority when dealing with tobacco control measures, quote, has always been to preempt the field, preferably to put it all on the federal level, but if they can't do that, at least on the state level. And why was that? Because, quote, we could never win at the local level. Finally, the fourth benefit of local control that I want to touch on is that it's an importance to building a movement, particularly when cutting edge policy is at, is at stake. And again, as many of you would have experience with, when uh, advocates or public health officials at, at a local level are seeking to advance new proposals uh, to be successful, they usually need to build a base of public support and therefore political power, which in turn fosters the creation of a movement. Because development of a policy at a local level creates and encourages community debate, education, and engagement, which is different from what happens with most policies that are decided in state capitals or in Washington. This engagement at the community level creates a broader base, not just of public understanding about the importance of the new policy, but also public support and commitment for that idea, leading to a level of political support that's going to result in more sustainable policies and a foundation of support for ongoing progress. Now, on the other side of the coin, there are considerations that may, depending on the facts and depending on the policy that's involved, there are considerations that may argue for a more uniform policy. And depending on the issue at stake, they may it may be appropriate and it may even be uh, necessary that a uniform policy preempt lower levels of government. One area where this might come into uh, come play would be where a policy involves communicating information to the public in a way where there is a risk of potential fusion if we have multiple messages in multiple formats prescribed by multiple governments. Um, so this would come into play if we're trying to communicate a warning or convey complicated information that the public may have difficulty understanding and we want clarity and consistency that people will become familiar with the messaging and hear it over and over and understand it and not be confused by uh, conflicting or multiple messages. So a good example of this would be the nutrition labels on packaged foods described under the 
Federal Nutrition Labeling and Education Act, which preempts states and cities from mandating their own nutrition labels on foods. Having a consistent approach uh, in the grocery store around the country on packaged foods had an environment in which consumers are able to become familiar with the label over time and more, make more effective use of it in making their own purchasing decisions and selecting their diets. This would be complicated and undermined if there were any different formats across the country, and consumers would probably end up confused and maybe frustrated. Other examples of similar kinds of things might include the Surgeon General's warning on cigarette packs or the safety information that airline flight attendants give you before the, uh, before the flight takes off. Potential benefit of uniformity comes into play in areas of regulation where there is an unusual uh, cost involved in regulating, so that there are both cost savings involved in having a single regulator, and perhaps there wouldn't be any interest on the part of lower levels of government in taking on the area of regulation. Uh, an extreme example of this would be one of the few areas where we have absolute preemption of state and local involvement because of existing federal law, and that would be the area of nuclear safety regulation. But uh, other areas might be those where regulating involves the need to have a large uh, staff of technical experts or requires a large capital investment and infrastructure in things like te testing laboratories. So this might be true if we were talking about laboratories to determine automobile safety standards, for example, might be another area. And so if there are areas like this, not only might there be uh, benefits in centralizing the regulation, but it be that there would be relatively little lost from prison anyway, because these might be the kinds of areas where few, if any, lesser governments would be interested in taking on those expenses unilaterally. A consideration that, that, that sometimes comes up uh, involves the fact that, that if health advocates focus their energies on taking the policy to a single higher level, the idea would be that this would avoid the need to spend time and money and energy and effort to win adoption of policies at a large number of jurisdictions. And so this can feel very attractive if someone thinks about the number of counties in a state or the number of cities in the in the country, the idea of proceeding at the local level may sound very um, inefficient, and so there may be a temptation to to say, so let's focus our efforts uh, upward and address our energies there. Difficulty with this, and this requires careful analysis, as Julie has already pointed out, is that while maybe some benefit to health advocates, there may actually be a great benefit to special interests who are opposed to what you want to do, because they too can concentrate their resources in fewer places and on a smaller number of key decision makers. And most importantly, many of the most powerful interests will wield a great deal of influence at those higher levels, and they will probably have long-standing relationships with the key lawmakers, or at a minimum will employ some of the most influential lobbyists who have those kinds of relationships. The final potential benefit of uniformity that we want to uh, acknowledge or, or discuss here is that there are considerations of equity that come into play, especially when there's wide variation in terms of the, the likelihood of something being done in different local jurisdictions or in different states of the country. Where that's the case and where it feels very unlikely that some cities would act or that some states would act, there can be a genuine concern about the equity of the likely outcome if, uh, if things proceed simply at the lower level. There may be a concern that in those jurisdictions that are not going to act, people will simply be left behind because there wasn't the political will to act or there weren't resources or there wasn't a, a public health infrastructure in that jurisdiction. And, of course, equity is one of the um, overriding values in the public health world. So we're all concerned about doing something to ensure that no one is left behind. So in these areas, uh, especially if we're talking about floor preemption, as Julie discussed earlier, preemption is a way of assuring that no one is left behind. 
when questions come along is if you're proceeding at a higher level of government and you're presented with a very difficult decision and you think that you may have to accept ceiling preemption as a way of making sure no one is left behind because ceiling preemption is also an assurance that no one else can go further ahead and you have to decide whether that's a price we're paying in order to bring some level of protection to those who would otherwise be left behind. Okay, so those are those are some of the main kinds of pros and cons that might tug you in different directions depending on the policy that's at stake and how you might see it paying off, playing out. What do you do with all this kind of information and how can you think about approaching a preemption question when you think one might arise in an issue area that you're focused on in real life? There aren't easy answers to that. I'm, I'm sorry we don't have any easy answer, answers chair today, but, but there is one thing that we think is pretty clear, and that is that um, if there's a defense at all against coming uh, in a place that you didn't want to come out or having an ill-considered decision on your part or ending up with unintended consequence uh, of your decision, it's a way to protect against that. We think the best defense is preparation, and preparation is especially important here because preemption decisions, if you prepare in advance, the decisions will be something that is made um, in some of the worst possible environments for careful and reflective decision making because these are decisions that are usually made toward the end of the political sausage making process in the heat of, um, of land and horse trading, often made in legislative hallways or behind a closed door, or late at night in a conference committee. And this means that if you want to maximize your chance of keeping the outcome, your best bet is to plan for preemption, do your best to think through the pros and cons very carefully in advance, to identify the likely scenarios so you can anticipate the potential pitfalls, and try to go into the process with the clear possible understanding of your organization's bottom line. How do you go about preparing for this? Well, first of all, you, if you are going to pr be proposing anything that is likely to threaten powerful interests, then you need to anticipate that those interests will inject preemption into the debate. It doesn't matter whether you've drafted a proposal that doesn't include preemption. You need to plan for the likelihood that it is going to appear along the way, and probably not when you expect it or in the form in which you expect it. You need to prepare for that by seizing the opportunities early on to think it through as carefully as possible and to think the consequences through from the big picture perspective, the long-term perspective, because once you get down to the deal making of legislation, it's going to be very hard to maintain the bigger perspective that you otherwise uh, want to bring to this. And maybe the most critical starting point in all of this is about thinking through who is the we who to be uh, shaping the policy? Who is it that ought to be defining what the position of the public health community is? Who has a right to be heard and to participate in that decision? And that's the, the critical starting point, because in most cases, there will be a smaller group of insiders who are doing the actual um, legislative lobbying at the State House or at the County Commission or up in Cap Hill. Should they make a decision? Should it be the people who've been working the hardest on the issue, even if they're not uh, present when the question is presented? Should it be everyone who's worked on a law at a lesser level and would see that law um, nullified? Is it one in the community who cares about it? And how important is it to you to try to drive to some degree of public health consensus? You really need to think those things through in advance. And, and Julie and I would suggest to you that you think literally about bringing people together on under one roof in advance to really try to thrash this through in a, a calmer environment in advance. That doesn't mean that you're going to be able to solve the questions or come to a complete consensus, but it really does help you to narrow the areas of disagreement and define areas of agreement. So I just talked about the planning process in general. Now I'm going to talk more specifically about weighing the pros and cons. Of course, the goal of the planning process 
is, is to get a good sense of just what the pros and cons are likely to be if preemption is introduced in the mix. Now, you've heard about some of the benefits of local control and the benefits of uniformity from a public health perspective. So those are some of the considerations. Now, ordinarily, Doug and I would argue that and history and case law would frequently back us up that there ought to be a presumption against preemption and that everything else being equal, preemption should not be accepted without a specific compelling reason from a public health perspective. But there might be compelling reasons and how those specific trade-offs are going to add up. That is going to depend on the specific policy and the specific communities involved. Now, one of the fact sheets that will be coming out um, is about negotiating preemption and suggests some of the questions to ask when you're looking at these pros and cons, including questions like, what trade-offs would your group or coalition of stakeholders, what trade-offs would they be willing to make to keep preemption out of the bill? What trade-offs might make some form of preemption acceptable? What forms of preemption are unacceptable or unacceptable and in what circumstances? What would be the impact on communities that have laws that would be preempted? What are they giving up? What are they gaining? What likelihood that evolving science is going to provide evidence for a new policy that could be preempted? If a preemptive law is passed, what would be the impact on communities that don't have laws addressing the issue? How likely would they be to pass laws on their own? So those kinds of questions. But if the most important question and the one that you're going to have to probably back to repeatedly in this process is if this bill passed, would it be worth the trade-off? Now, you can probably guess it's likely to come down to hard choices, especially when the argument becomes one about whether it's better to accept half of or a preemptive law than to get nothing. And, and there may not be very clear answers, but our hope is that if you've taken the opportunity to think in advance about the possible consequences consequences of preemption, the issue that's being worked on and all the stakeholders involved to weigh the pros and cons from these different perspectives, then you're going to be well positioned to implement a strategy to deal with preemption that is informed and can be proactive and not just reactive. Now, another uh, point I want to talk about is the traps that can come up when dealing with preemption. Of course, act Kids working on issues where preemption com have been co is commonly raised have learned the hard way about different preemption traps that can be thrown out, and we want to give you the benefit of some of that hard-won experience. Now, preemption language doesn't necessarily come with a warning label. It often doesn't even use the word preemption. So advocates have learned to look for other words and phrases that are commonly used to preempt state or local authority. Again, there will be a fact sheet with a list of specific examples, but here are a few of the more common ones, words like uh, uniform regulation or the, the state legislature will be the exclusive regulator, uh, supersede, the provisions of this act shall supersede any other statute, municipal ordinance, um, no, or stringent, no, more poli no political subdivision may enact an or ordinance unless the ordinance or resolution is the same or similar to and no more stringent than a state statute. And then this is one of my personal things right now. Statewide concern, the General Assembly further declares that the licensing and regulation of massage parlors are matters of statewide concern. So these are just some of the examples where there's preemptive effect without using the word preemption. Now another common trap is, is uh, dealing with preemptive language that is unnecessarily broad. And as you know, every word in a law matters, and this is almost doubly so for preemptive language. So if there's a decision that some degree of preemption is acceptable, uh, Think about whether there's alternative wording that can get you where you think you need to be, but with a much with a less sweeping preemptive effect to leave the door open for the future. And indeed, if you decide that that some kind of preemption is inevitable and acceptable given the trade-offs, then you may want to draft some language ahead of the time when things are still calm and have it ready in your back pocket so that when things do heat up, uh, you're not cut off guard. And that brings me to the final point on this slide, that you always have to be on your guard. And again, as I'm sure as many, of, if not all of you have experienced, legislative language, particularly language that is a little bit controversial, can be a complete and utter moving target. A bill that contains no preemption today can at any point in the process turn 180 degrees and suddenly become entirely preemptive. And as Doug has alluded to, it, although this could happen at any time, usually and all too often, it happens at the 11th hour when emotions are high and people are tired. So with preemption, it's really not over until it's over. And, and finally, there's nothing more important in all of this than 
thinking hard in advance about what is your bottom line. How much of a price are you willing to be prepared to pay to get your policy adopted? Um, there's nothing more important than that, even though we recognize that it's not always realistic to think that uh, a coalition and, and a coming together of public health groups can all agree on an ironclad or enforceable bottom line, but the point is that there are almost always is one, and you need to see what you can do to understand that in advance. Trying to consensus around that is a critical part of that process because the broader the base of support that you bring to that position, the stronger your negotiating position is going to be when push comes to shove, and it helps to minimize the chances that your coalition is going to fragment or lose its momentum. You also need to think about your contingency plans and some of the scenarios that, that might play out and what you will do if you're presented with various alternatives. You want to go into the process prepared with um, language that you would offer for an anti preemptive provision or counter proposals that you might make to narrow a preemptive provision if one shows up. What are you willing to give up uh, or to trade off for a preemption if you feel that you're going to be forced to accept it? Are you able to um, insist that the regulatory standard be higher, for example? And most importantly, how do you know when you ought to walk away? If, it, if the question is, do we accept half a loaf? If your answer is yes, then the question becomes, well, would you accept a third of a loaf? Where do where you draw the line? Because in almost every situation, there is some point at which it will make more sense to walk away and try to come at the problem in a different venue or to build your political support for the proposal and come back at a future date. That's one of the t very toughest questions but the most important to think about and being fully prepared on it is one of the most important things you can do to position yourself to shape the ultimate outcome. Basically, our overview, we, before we turn to questions uh, that you might have, we want to thank all of you for investing your time, your time and hopefully at least some of your attention over the last 45 minutes. We've been racing through an awful lot of material and we don't expect you to remember a lot of the specifics that we've talked about today, but if we hope that you remember one thing. We hope that we've persuaded you that this issue really does matter to you and it's worth spending some of your energy uh, on mastering. And in a larger sense, we hope that the public health community really will find a way to begin a process that will lead us all to have a more sophisticated approach for managing these issues because they're going to be important to every one of the policy areas that we pursue, whether it's in obesity prevention or in, in many of the other public health areas. And we think that addressing these issues um, strategically will make us all more effective in protecting public health. With that, we want to thank all of you. And unless Dean um, or, or Sam have anything they want to say at this point, I think we will turn to questions that we're now receiving from some of you on the call. Thank you, um, This is Christy again, and we're actually going to do a few minutes about N-Plan, and then we'll turn to questions. We'll give you a little bit of a break. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Of course you are. Right. No, it's okay. Um, so as, as mentioned, um, you can submit questions via the Q&A panel, which is below the chat box. And if you have any trouble with that, you can go to the chat box, um, and we'll, we'll get those questions to Doug and Julie. Also, I to um, mention that we have um, a white paper, as, as Doug alluded to, on our website right now that uh, talks about preemption, um, many of the points that Doug and Julie made here today, um, in addition to just going in, in more in depth into the subject. Um, so you can download that from our website uh, right now, and then we'll have a few fact sheets that will be available in the coming weeks um, that just prevent, uh, that just present the, the uh, talking points about preemption. Um, and of course, the, the webinar is being recorded and will be available online in addition to a PDF version of the slides. Um, so we'll send an email out to all of you when that information is available in about a week. So we just wanted to um, give you a little bit more information about what resources are available to you from NPLAN, um, what we're calling legal technical assistance. Again, I'm Christine Fry. That's me on the slide, um, the Policy and Program Associate for NPLAN. So um, 
many of you have, I'm sure, seen a landscape like this either in your community or as you're traveling around your region. Um, we, as Sam said earlier, we work with communities to use policy and law to, to improve opportunities for physical activity and access to healthy foods, um, to, in, in essentially to make environments like these healthier. We do this through technical assistance, which um, we talk about in, in three ways. We do um, a lot of just legal research, both in-house and we commission it from legal scholars, like folks like Doug and Julie, you just heard, um, to understand how uh, specific legal principles affect public health policy, and in particular, childhood obesity prevention. Um, we use this information uh, first to train advocates and policymakers like yourselves in webinars and presentations like this one. Um, we also use it to build a foundation for the second component of our technical assistance, which are our model policies. These model policies, we have a growing catalog of legally sound models written by staff attorneys that you can download and adapt to your local circumstances. Um, we have, it's like, as you see on your screen, um, model physical activity standards for child care providers. These um, standards uh, work to get phys more physical activity, higher quality physical activity into the child care setting. Um, and so you can use these as local or state regulations, or you can work with individual providers in your area to implement these voluntarily. Uh, we also have model menu labeling ordinance, uh, which is a hot topic right now uh, that you can download, adapt, and implement through your local uh, or state legislative process. The third component um, of our technical assistance is that we have limited capacity to provide legal information um, through trainings and one-on-one -on -one interactions to communities who are using our policies. Um, so we present webinars like this one on a regular basis. We also prevent, present at, train, at conferences and other convenings um, where folks from public health and others who are working on childhood obesity prevention in particular gather. Um, um, so that we can uh, talk about uh, how the law affects their work. So now I'm just going to um, tell you about a few specific policies that we have available on our website right now to get you thinking about how you can use the information that we talked about today um, to, uh, to advance your goals um, locally. So we have um, a whole body of work on joint use agreements. Joint use agreements are agreements between schools and cities or towns that open up school facilities for um, after hour recreational use for the community. So we have several model um, joint use agreements that you can download and adapt. Uh, you can also, we also have a whole body of liability research um, because we, that liability is a big concern when setting up these agreements. We have a 50-state survey that um, demystifies the liability issues um, and explains how they uh, affect joint use agreements in each state. On the physical activity side, we, we have um, several complete streets policies that are coming soon. Um, and these are complete streets policies are um, ways to help different modes of transit travel together safely on the same streets and sidewalks. So as this picture shows, um, these policies help ensure that bicyclists can travel safely along cars, um, public transit, maybe light rail down in the center of the street, and pedestrians can also move safely uh, through these thoroughfares. On the side, we have um, several policies that address access to healthy foods. So we have, for example, zoning language um, that protects and promotes farmers markets as an approved land use. And farmers markets can be an excellent way to bring um, fresh fruits and vegetables to communities that may not have a bricks and mortar grocery store, may not have stores offer very fresh produce. We also have policies that, um, that relay access to unhealthy foods. So we have this healthy school food zone ordinance that uh, prohibits fast food restaurants from locating within a certain distance of schools. And that distance can be set uh, by the community depending on the local circumstances. Uh, so this is a way to um, promote the use of the school lunch program and to uh, limit access for kids during the school day to, uh, to fast food restaurants. 
restaurants in the vicinity of the school. Here are a few examples. Uh, we have many more on our website, um, and you should check back frequently because we're always adding um, additional policies and resources. And our address is there at the bottom of the screen. This is like when you visit us. Um, so please do check it out and let us know if you download something. Let us know how you use it. So we'd like to get feedback if there's something you feel like we're missing, um, or just to hear your stories of, of how things are working in your community. So there's contact information. Uh, there's the website again. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to follow up uh, with me after the webinar. And now I'm going to pass the, the microphone back to Doug and Julie, who will be moderating um, your question and answers. Questions and answers. Thank you, Christine. Uh, we've received a number of questions from those of you on the call, and we're going to do our best to see answer some of those. Before we begin, we do want to tell you that that we're really reluctant today to try to speak to the specific laws, and I don't know whether we'll receive questions about that, but um, we would be hesitant to try to get into specific about if you have a question about a specific, for example, and whether it's preemptive. We're probably going to try to duck those questions today, although though we and others from NPLAN would be happy to talk with you offline and gather more information about, about specific circumstances. Well, easy questions um, that's come in is whether the um, audio of this webinar and the PowerPoint are going to be available after the conference. And, and as Christine alluded to, um, and us uh, to make that available on its website uh, not long after we conclude today. And you should all be receiving an email in the next week or so that'll um, link you back to that. So, so yes, it will be available. The first substantive question is comes from someone who has asked what are the effective strategies for overcoming or overturning preemptive laws? Well, this is an area where there definitely are no easy solutions, uh, and people have been looking for them for a long time. So the real answer to this question, and certainly this has been the painful experience in tobacco prevention and control, is that it is really difficult difficult once preemption gets locked into place. It is really difficult to roll it back or overturn it. And that's why it is so important to think about this in advance. And if it's if preemption is something that represents a threat to health, to know that at the outset and to do what you can to keep it from ever getting onto the books. It's truly because whether we're talking about a state legislature or even more so the Congress, once those bodies have taken up an issue, especially if it is a controversial issue where um, the process of policy making has been painful because there are different interests competing hard over it. Once the body has pulled that issue to the ground, they are very reluctant to get back into it if they think they've once um, concluded that work. And so it's very hard to persuade them to reopen the issues. That's why there are still quite a number of states in this country that in which um, we don't have smoke-free policies because tobacco industry lobbyists and others were very effective years ago in waiting than half of the states of the country to adopt preemptive laws to preclude cities and counties from adopting smoking regulations. And it's been a long, hard battle to try to roll those back. Okay, another question about uh, what does it mean to be preempted um, what happens if a local government passes a law uh, that is printed? Well, uh, what typically happens if a, if the law passes and then the, the the government tries to enforce the law, and that's a situation where the preemption issues are going to be raised again. If they weren't raised uh, during the, the legislative process, it could be a defense to the enforcement of that law. And so the uh, the people, the groups, the like if it's a, a, a smoke-free law, um, then what we've seen happen very common in the uh, tobacco control context is that the typically if it's a bar or restaurant that's um, challenging the law, is going to challenge it and say that it's preempted by say the state indoor clean air act, and it's going to uh, look at language in that law 
that, that claims is, is preemptive. Um, and so that's how typically uh, these issues play out. Now, sometimes it happens when the, the, when the government is actually trying to enforce the law, and sometimes it happens right after the law is passed. Um, while there's a, usually a delay period before the law becomes uh, effective, and in, it's in that delay period or uh, that time period that a challenge is going to be raised. And that's very typical uh, it, with, with, we've seen the menu labeling actually, and we've seen it with like the, the, the ban in San Francisco on the sale of tobacco products in pharmacies that during that interim period, uh, a business interest will challenge the law on preemptive grounds and various other legal grounds that they, they think might be applicable. And so then it becomes up to a court to decide, and the court is going to be interpreting uh, the language of the laws that the, the groups being sued claim preempts the state or local law, and the proponents of the state or local law are going to be making arguments about why that law doesn't preempt what they've done. And no, it can be very um, frustrating and, and resource consuming for local governments uh, to deal with these lawsuits, which is one of the reasons why we provide legal technical assistance to communities who are dealing, who are defending like tobacco control statutes. The question asks about a specific bill that's pending before the Congress, and, and as I said, I don't think we want to speak the merits of a particular legislative proposal, but this question says that the bill in Congress would preempt more comprehensive local ordinances and asks how does the federal legislation have to be modified to enable more comprehensive ordinances to remain? Well, question whether we're talking about the specific bill that the, this questioner had in mind or um, any other bill, this goes back to Julie's point that preemptive provisions are something that can be negotiated and worded just like any other part of legislation. And so here, the question um, difficulty is not so much in figuring out how to it, because you can add provisions to legislation to specifically ensure that, that there is no preemption, or to ensure that the preemption is only floor preemption that says in so many words that local governments are free to do something that goes beyond what the Congress is doing. And as Julie mentioned earlier, that that was the prevailing model in this country for most of the history of our nation. So it's, it's possible to do that. The real challenge is not coming up with the wording, but rather coming up with the political um, will or clout or influence to get that provision to be the one that the one that prevails. And that's probably a different seminar than this one today. Which, um, through the questions here, I know there was one that came in about where people might might go to find kind of an inventory of some of the uh, areas where preemption is taking place. I don't have the specific wording in front of me, but I know that was the, the thrust of one of the questions, and actually questions asking where is a good place to learn about uh, some of the local and state preemptive laws. And for the, if we're talking about obesity prevention, the NPLAN network is a great resource. And if we're talking about public health in general, the best resources are probably the, the professional associations that many of you belong to, whether we're talking about NATO or ASTO or um, NALBO. Each of those organizations tracks the population in general in these areas and is very concerned about the impact of preemption on public health. You heard um, a quote earlier from the National Conference of State Legislatures, another good source on this. So do maintain inventories of things like that. Well, and I would also encourage, I, I mean, I don't mean to be to tooting on horns, but uh, both NPLAN and our program here, the Tobacco Control Legal Consortium, are their national program designed to provide legal technical assistance to public health, health advocates who are developing laws and policies. And so, you know, a good um, idea is always to take, if you have something in mind, to take it to a lawyer to, to talk about these issues and, and learn and, and get advance notice of where there might be problems um, and, and where things can be fixed to avoid problems. 
Um, so that would be a, a pointer that I would like to pass on. Um, uh, another question is whether you give a specific example of how preemption has played out in a specific instance in your own professional experience. I don't know if this is a great example, but one of the early ones that I think of when I worked at the Attorney General's office, and this would have been in the quite a time ago, um, there was a time when uh, the industry was regulated very, very differently than it is today, and there was a comprehensive overhaul that resulted in airline deregulation. And following that deregulation, a group of the states got together and tried to lay out some guidelines to deal with the fact that airline advertising was full of a lot of things that we thought were highly deceptive. We had an energy crisis going on at the time, and you would see advertisements for airfares that might uh, say that the airfare was $400, and then when you got to the airport, you'd find that there was a $25 surcharge, a fuel surcharge, for example, or you would see airfares that turned out to be the one way fare when you assumed that it was a round-trip ticket. And so states tried to intervene and develop some guidelines and try to do some policing of deceptive advertising for uh, airlines. And that ended up going all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States that ruled that when Congress had deregulated the airline industry, they had preempted states from having any say about deception in airline advertising. So that was a, um, a disappointment to those who were trying to address that. And then the question that's about what, what does preemptive language look like? Does it contain the word preemption? Um, and uh, no, it, it may not contain the word preemption. Uh, that's why uh, there's there's different ways to uh, formulate uh, preemption. And so that, that's why we're going to have a fact sheet available to, to highlight some of those words. But you look for words like supersede, stringent, um, exclusivity, uh, uniform, statewide concern, these kinds of words are usually a red flag word to indicate that, that preemption is, is what that provision is about. And we got a message that that was the last question that we had time for. So thank you, everybody. Do you have no, thank you very much. And with that, we'll turn it back to Christine. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Doug and Julie. It was a great session. Um, so I just want to wrap up and thank all of you for joining us and um, want to tell you about our next webinar, which will be in October, about community gardens. And we'll look at it from uh, the legal research and um, public health perspective. So and plan will be having webinars at least every month for the next year. Um, so please do join us for the ones that um, are relevant to you. And thank you, and um, we'll talk to you later. Last thing for those of you who are still on, um, we will be sending an evaluation along with the materials uh, in about a week. So please do fill that out and let us know how we did. Thank you.